Hello, my name is Janet Gola. I'm a past president of UFDC, the United Federation of Doll Clubs, and I'm here today at the home of Julie Bluis. Julie Bluis has graciously offered us the chance to view her collection, and today I will be focusing on her French bébés. I would like to thank Ruby Lane, who is filming this today. They have been a wonderful support to UFDC and continue to be, and we are so appreciative of all that they have done for the organization. One thing I'd just like to mention, UFDC has an incredible convention every year, and one of the highlights of our convention is our competitive room. And in that room, we judge dolls that our members bring, and they are judged on three major criteria the condition of the doll, the originality of the doll, and most importantly, the rarity of the doll. The dolls that we're going to see today are incredibly exceptional dolls, and many of them have been blue ribbon winners at the UFDC conventions. And one of the most important things in Julie's collection is the incredible rarity of some of her dolls. Some of them are one of a kind. So it is my pleasure today to begin the discussion on French bébés. French bébés appeared in the latter half of the 1870s and they were produced till about 1900. There was a secondary movement at the beginning of the 1900s and the last doll that we will be looking at was created in 1915. So we're going to start today looking at our first doll, which is very high up on the shelf and that is a Hure. I just want to mention that Victor Hugo once wrote that the last, that the first, ba first baby is a continuation of the last doll. So it's important when we're looking at these dolls to remember that even though they're beautiful and works of art, that they also had a purpose. And the purpose was to prepare little girls to be wives and mothers. So they have an educational component that was very important at the time they were created. The dolls at the top on, on each side are dolls that were produced by the Hure Company. And in the 1870s, a gentleman named Lemoyne purchased the Hure Company, and it was at that time that the first babies were being introduced. So the Hure that I'm pointing to here, where the camera is focused on, uh, these are very rare dolls. You can find them, and they're Hure Bebes. Most collectors are very familiar with the Hure Poupes that were made earlier by Madame Hure. But these dolls, even though they're much later, they have a very similar face. However, the bodies were different, although some of them also, like the original Poupes, had Gouda Percha bodies, and we'll look at a Hure Bebe with a Gouda Percha body in a moment. But this one has a composition body. Now, it's interesting of the two Hures that we're going to be seeing because the face on this doll that we're looking at right now looks earlier than the face on the other Hure that we're going to be looking at that has the earlier body. But in the factory, sometimes stock was sitting around and they grabbed whatever was made there. So if we can point the camera on the other side now, on the far side, we have a Hure with a Gouda Percha body. So Gouda Percha was basically rubber, and they also used it on the early poupées, as I mentioned, but it was a, not the best material. I mean, they were trying to always find, when they were creating these babies, unbreakable materials because children were playing with them, so things got broken. And they always marketed them, no matter what they were made of, with the bisque heads as unbreakable dolls. Most of the manufacturers called their dolls unbreakable. So usually they were referring to the bodies, not the bisque heads. However, the Gouda Percha tended to dry out, it cracks, it doesn't age well. So eventually they abandoned that and started going to the more common, at that time, composition dolls. The composition dolls, though, however, were interesting in that they were quite jointed. They had jointed ankles, they're jointed at the wrists, they're jointed at the knees and the elbows, which was unusual for babies this early. Later on, uh, towards the end of the development of the French baby, most of the dolls were jointed, but on these early dolls, it's very, very rare to find that. I just want to mention that when we're looking at the babies, 
today, we're not going to be going in chronological order necessarily. We're going to be looking at the dolls as they have been placed in Julie's doll room. So if we look at the doll in between the two remarkable hurrays, there's an even more probably remarkable doll, and that was produced by uh, a joint venture between an artist named André Marc and a couturier designer in Paris named Marguerite Lacroix, and they were made in around 1915. So all, politics also play into the production of dolls and what they look like. And at that period, France is fighting the Second World War. They're, they're trying very hard to promote French products. They're competing with the Germans. So Marguerite Lacroix had an idea that she would produce a series of dolls that would be artistic, that would be original, that would be competitive with anything the Germans were bringing out. And she worked with the artist Mark, and they produced this very unusual doll. She also brought in an artist to create the body, which was extremely unusual. And she wanted to produce a child doll, but an older child doll. So not, not a, a young child, but a child on the edge of adolescence. So the doll has a very elongated torso, which was unusual for babies, and very long and graceful arms. Now, we believe that only a hundred of these dolls were ever made, and some are found with numbers inscribed in red on the back of the heads, but not all of them. And they were reflective of French culture. Some were dressed as queens, some were dressed as historical figures, and some were dressed also to reflect regional costuming around France. And here we have a wonderful boy doll, almost dressed like a little soldier. But these are, again, I mean, there were 100 produced and they didn't all survive, so incredibly rare dolls. This would be the piece de resistance to most French doll collectors of babies. However, in Julie's collection, it is just one of the remarkable dolls that she has. The dolls that you're looking at right now were all produced by one manufacturer, the Steiner Company. Jules Steiner uh, had a doll factory he was a fascinating character. He was an inventor throughout his whole life. He produced patents right until the time he died. Uh, he even produced a patent for a toilet. And this patent is still applied to airplane toilets to this day, the flushing mechanism. So he was quite a character. He was an inventor. He was trained originally as a clockmaker. His mother was Swiss and he grew up in France in an area that made clocks. So many of his dolls are uh, have animation or they're automatons or they, they do things. Uh, he enjoyed that, but he also had remarkable faces for his dolls. And he had early dolls, um, babies, that were not marked. Um, the one in the middle of the case is one of his early dolls, and she will have probably no markings whatsoever on her. And then eventually he produced two series of dolls, and the first one, the earliest one, he called series, and then the second one he called figure dolls. So they were marked the series dolls, S-I-E, and they had number uh, designations going from A to E, maybe F, I'm not sure, but anyway, um, the doll on the left-hand side of the case with the wonderful dimples, what a happy expression, she is a very rare series F. And so they did go up to F with the series dolls and is extremely, extremely rare. And you can see her, just her wonderful, happy expression. The doll on the right of her, of the, of the um, early, early Steiner doll, is a figure E. So she is a very rare figure doll. The figures were made slightly later than the series dolls. But figure E is the rarest of all those dolls, and as such, also commands the highest price. The doll, the little boy at the front of them, I believe is a figure A. That was probably the most popular model that Steiner produced, and they are the easiest uh, ones to find. With the series dolls, it's series A and C that are the easiest to find, as it is with the figures A and C. I'm just going to briefly mention Steiner bodies are very interesting and very distinctive in their modeling. Um, they have very uh, funny fingers in a way. They 
are stubby little short fingers and they're all about the same length. Some people refer to them as bananas looking fingers. And he used uh, in his composition material, you can often see a lot of pink or red. This is a way that people can tell if it's a, a Steiner body, if it has that tinge. This doll was created by a man named George Most, and there isn't a lot of information about him. He didn't produce a lot of dolls, but the dolls that he did produce are extremely distinctive. He used a four-part mold for the faces, which was different because most of the doll heads were created with a two-part mold. So it was a little more complex, and, and of course, when you're firing these things, there's more chance of things going wrong. Uh, so it's a little bit more complex. And he wanted to be able to produce a doll that you could bury the mouth. So he wanted to be able to make a doll with an open mouth with teeth uh, or a modeled, modeled teeth. In this particular case, the doll has no teeth, but there's a very wide space between the lips. So that was his innovation. They have incredibly distinctive faces. Uh, you can see what a, a wonderful face, almost like a character doll. And he produced dolls for 30 years, beginning with um, the manufacturing of French fashion dolls. But really, it's the bebés that are, are the most wonderful, I, I think, of all the dolls that he made. This doll is wearing an exceptional costume, which is not original to the doll, but the work and the detail on that is just really something remarkable. Just want to briefly mention this beautiful doll created by the Jumeau Company. She was created for the expositions that were being held in Paris uh, in the in the 1880s, and she predates the character dolls and was a very special doll. They were really only made for the expositions to show off the t skill and talent of the factory. And this doll is interesting because she was based on a real person. There was a very famous African queen who was uh, coming to, to Paris and England as well, and she kind of swept the social scene, and people were absolutely obsessed with her. You can tell by that face that she was absolutely stunningly beautiful. And for many people at that time, they had not really seen very many African people. So to have such a spectacularly beautiful woman who was royal as well, just really captured the imagination of the people at that time. Etienne Denemar came into the French Bebe market very late, and unfortunately he was always struggling. He was a sad story. He actually had a nervous breakdown because the company was doing so badly and, and passed away shortly after the company closed. He just came into the market too late and there was too much compet competition. His doll faces are, are almost comical, um, but he did produce a, a limited number of dolls with painted features. The most commonly found are clowns. This doll with her painted on mask could be one of a kind. Um, I don't believe I've ever seen another one and I have never seen one talked about in a magazine or a book. I think that Julie has the one and only doll. So she's, she's really remarkable and she's a masquerade figure. So we just wanted to mention briefly about that company. It was a small company. And then we're going to go to the dolls around her. <laughs> so one of the things that's remarkable in Julie's collection are the incredible number of, of mulatto and darker face dolls that she has in her collection. These were rare. They didn't produce a lot of them. There was a fascination, as I mentioned, with, with African culture at that period of time. And a limited number were created, uh, mostly for Parisian little girls, because they, were, they found it fascinating. There, there was also a pocket of wealthy African people living in Paris, so they could have been marketed to them as well. Later on in the Jumeau factory history, they were producing dolls for South America, and those dolls have, have different features as well. So they were, they were marketing to whoever would buy their dolls. We'll talk a little bit more about Jumeau later because he was a fascinating, fascinating manufacturer and individual. 
So here we have, I'm just going to focus on three examples, starting with this little matador doll. I mean, what a wonderful costuming. Jumeau was famous for their costuming. Uh, Jumeau's wife was a couturier stylish, and she, she not only designed a lot of the costuming, but was hands-on in the creation of the costuming as well. And the doll behind it is, uh, I believe, it's a Deposé model of the Jumeau company. And then the large doll standing beside that one with the wonderful pink costume is also a product of the Jumeau factory. So I was mentioning about the Jumeau company and in the period of the manufacture of the Bebe's, the original owner's son took over the factory. His name was Emile Jumeau. And one of the earliest Bebe's that was produced is this wonderful little doll in white. Jumeau wasn't the first company to produce Bebe's, but they started producing them very, very early. And the very first ones, as, as we're looking at this one, have incredible eyes. Uh, that we refer to in the doll world as wraparound eyes, and this is a great example of that. You can see how exaggerated the eyes are, how large they are. And also the eyes themselves, the glass eyes, always had a spiral uh, in, in them that you could see in the irises. Later on, they developed what they called more realistic eyeballs. But at this period, it really wasn't about realism at all. <laughs> Jumeau also produced their composition bodies. They were one of the few manufacturers who did everything. Many of the manufacturers produced their heads at other factories, and we'll talk about that as we go along. But this one is the product of the Jumeau factory from head to toe. Jumeau entered a lot of competitions and he won many gold medals and uh, you can see sometimes the age of the doll by how the doll is marked because he would mention that on, on his trademarks that they had won a gold medal. But these early dolls are only marked usually with a size number on the back of the head and they're divided into two series. The earlier ones, the first series, which this doll is an example of, have very low numbering and the second series dolls have higher numbering. So that's one way that you can tell which is which. The doll behind it is called an AT and it is one of the rarer dolls that are found. Uh, it was produced by a manufacturer who probably had his doll heads made for him at a company called Gautier. We will mention them very briefly. They were a large company and they did many, many doll molds for different people. But he uh, designed, would design the very distinctive face, and then he would take the mold and have it developed by, by Gautier. His name was Andre Toulier, and his dolls are among the most coveted by collectors. Everybody would like to have an AT in their collection. You can see why. I mean, the face is just so beautiful. They really are like paintings. In the early Bebe's stage, really right through their history, they were trying to make a child that was idealized. So later on with the character movement that comes after this period, they were trying to make children that look more like real children. But at this period, no, it was about the ideal child. So it was probably encouraging, this is what you should look like, and this is how you should behave to go with your very delicate looks. You should be very calm and, and subtle in your demeanor. So. They really are wonderful works of art. This doll is an example of dolls created by a, a company called Petet and Demontier. It was a partnership of two gentlemen, Petet and Demontier. And as I was mentioning, they were always looking for an unbreakable aspect to their dolls. And they decided that they would make the doll hands, which is one of the more delicate areas of a doll, out of lead, metal hands. So they would be completely unbreakable. But you can imagine nowadays, we would never allow a child to play with <laughs> a doll that had any lead in any part of its body. And they have really distinctive faces. They just had that wonderful round face, very delightful face, and very unique. They made a limited number of dolls, but, uh, but collectors can certainly find them if they look hard enough. But always they want the lead hands because that is something very distinctive to that manufacturer. Two, 
The doll that you're looking at right now is another example from the Jumo factory, an early portrait bebe, uh, in a smaller size than the first one that we saw. It's also very interesting with dolls, the variation in sizes. You can get very, very tiny dolls, 8 inches right up to 36 inches, 42 inches, so they came in all different sizes. Jumo was a fascinating character. He was uh, a leader in, in marketing. He was the largest of all the doll manufacturers. At one point, he was producing 100,000 dolls a year. And he invented marketing techniques. He would put advertising on postcards. He would blanket the city with flyers. And many of the techniques that he used in, in marketing his products were copied by other companies and are still used today. So he was quite an interesting character. The little doll that you're looking at, and I would estimate that she's probably about eight inches tall, was made by the company of Francois Gautier. And Gautier was again a prolific manufacturer, but he was also a producer of dolls' heads for many other companies, as we were seeing earlier, and we will see again. He produced doll heads for, for many companies, and we're still doing research and discovering that he actually produced doll heads for more companies than we were aware of. So he had a huge factory with the ability to do that. But his own dolls have very interesting and unique little faces. And you can see, even with the small size of this doll, that is a classic, what we call FG face. And he had different, different markings. Uh, he used a cartouche for his later dolls with his initials in them. And the earlier dolls had block lettering. And I believe this is the block letter FG, the earlier of the, of the two. Their fun dolls are easy to find, and sometimes they're reasonably priced for a collector. So most Bebe collectors will definitely have a few FGs in their collection. Along with Jumeau, most collectors know the firm name of Brew. And Brew, again, was an early company. They were uh, pretty large manufacturing, and they produced some pretty incredible dolls and some innovative dolls. So this bébé is called a baby gourmand and she was able to eat and you would give her a little wafer and then I'm just going to come into the picture and show you her shoe because you can see at the bottom there's a little cutout on the sole and that was where the food would come out of again. So these dolls are very rare, not very many of them were made or survive, and the, she's also very heavy. She has a good weight to her because you can see her legs are, are bisque and her arms are bisque, and she is on a leather body torso. So Brew tended to make their dolls uh, in the early days with completely leather bodies, and this is unusual with the bisque legs. It was specially designed for this very, very rare gourmand doll. Uh, but the problem with the Brew bodies was that the bodies tended to slump. The stuffing would move around, and suddenly your doll couldn't stand up straight anymore. It could only sit down, or vice versa. So that was one of the things that Jumeau decided to make the composition bodies that were easier to position for children. And that's one of the distinctions between Brew and Jumeau. We're looking at two extraordinary dolls. One was produced by Halapo, the little girl in the green, and the other one is a second example of an AT. We saw a larger model earlier. And again, these dolls are greatly coveted by most French Bebe collectors, considered some of the most beautiful Bebe's that were ever created. Halapo on the left, the little girl in green, um, he was an interesting man. He, he apprenticed at the Barrois factory, which was a producer of French poupées. And originally, originally he worked there for very many years until he finally took over the company and began producing his own bébés. And they are all pretty similar in the face modeling. There was really only one design. He made a very limited number. Much, much smaller number, actually, than the AT on the, on the right-hand side. Earlier, I mentioned to you that most of the brew dolls are found with uh, leather arm, leather torsos. Uh, they can have bisque arms or 
uh, bisque legs or wooden legs or even leather legs. However, there are always exceptions to the rules and these two dolls are certainly that. They are models that Brew called the Brew Model and they had jointed wooden bodies and they are again relatively rare dolls to find. The one on the right is a very typical Brew Model with a wooden body but the doll beside her is rather unusual. She also has the Brew Model wooden jointed body but she has a rather unique feature. If we turn her around we can see that she has a key in the back and she actually has a music box mechanism and plays music. She's known as Baby Music and she is an extremely rare doll. We couldn't discuss French babies without including a couple of examples from the company of Schmidt and Fies, or Schmidt and his son. And here we have two wonderful little Schmidt dolls. The first doll that we're going to look at is one of the earliest models that they produced. And you can see the very distinctive round face. Schmidt babies always had very unique bodies. They had a very flat derriere so that they were designed to sit flat so they could sit up nicely. Most dolls had a rounded bottom, but they have a very flat bottom designed for that purpose. And they also had very unique arm structure. And in the doll world, they're referred to as gauntlet arms sometimes because they're almost like a, if you can picture a, a knight wearing a glove, you can see how they're really wide at the jointing. So that's always a distinct feature of Schmidt babies. The smaller doll beside is a later model, so you can see how the face evolved. However, the body will again be the same body, same flat bottom, and same gauntlet arms. Before we leave discussion about Steiner, we'll look at one last doll produced by that company. And this again is a relatively rare doll. She is a figure B, which was not such a rare doll. You can find them, but usually they have open mouth with teeth. The fact that this is a very small sized doll with a closed mouth makes her distinctive. This doll was produced by a company called Folk and Rousseau. Their later dolls in the, in the Bebe market, uh, some people think that they have almost a German look to their faces, and very few of them were made. They always have a very distinct face, and this is a very good example. The production of dolls was influenced by society for a large part. It was, they were influenced by art, what was happening that was contemporary with them, and they were also by education, how to educate children. And we're going to just discuss three artists who are an example of this. The first little man on top was made by a Belgian artist and the doll is Mark Van Rosen. It's interesting because she was an artist, her real name was Jean de Bouton, but she always called her art by the name Van Rosen. And not too many of these exist. And you can see he really has a character doll. And he would have been made around 1915. So one of, one of the very late dolls. If we go down to these dolls, in this case, we're going to be looking at the dolls on, on the sides. These dolls were made much earlier by, again, the Jumeau factory. And they are known as the Bebe Triste by Jumeau. And they're two Triste, but they're very distinctive. The tree doll was a doll that was produced very much influenced by what was happening in the French world of politics. And they were produced around 1877. And earlier, they had offered the crown to a descendant of the original French king. They decided that they wanted to have royalty back in the French world. And he just had a dispute with the government because he wanted to use the flag of the royal family with the bees on it. And they had, of course, the tricolor flag after the revolution. And he refused to take the crown because he wanted his flag or nothing. So that idea of reintroducing royalty ended over a piece of material, which is very interesting. 
Jumeau himself was a royalist. He was really keen on getting the royal family back in. And there was a time in, in Paris of really great feeling of nationalism and pride in their history. And in the 16th century, there was King Henry IV, and he was greatly revered as the greatest king of all time. So Jumeau decided he was going to hire an artist to design a model that was based on a sculpture of King Henry IV as a child. And he hired an artist named Ernst Carrier Boulez. Now, Carrier Boulez was a real character. He never turned down a job, they said. <laughs> he was constantly working and he produced a lot of sculptures and different kinds of art. So he never actually acknowledged that he made the doll's head. I mean, it was controversial. A lot of well-named artists probably designed doll's heads, but he didn't really want to be associated as a doll maker particularly. But he definitely designed the head after a sculpture that he had made of King Henry IV. These dolls are called trees because people thought they had rather a sad expression or a thoughtful expression. And these dolls are the same mold, head mold, but they're very different in design. The doll in the blue is a classic trees on a classic jumeau body. But the doll in the purple, she is actually an automaton. And you can see her holding her little theater and her little basket. So she also has a key wound mechanism and when moved, everything becomes activated. We have already discussed this A. Mark doll, but we're looking at the artist now. And Mark was an artist, he was a very classical artist. Unfortunately for him, he was producing art at a time that we had the Impressionist movement going on in Paris and also the Modernist movement. So even though he was recognized as being a wonderful sculptor, he was a sad character at the end of his life because his art was largely dismissed and people felt he was old fashioned. So he only designed one doll's head. This is the one that he designed. And sadly, he ended up in poverty and had a tragic end to his life, but he did produce an incredible doll. So that is a look at our three very different artists. And it just shows that dolls were definitely influenced by art because this doll is based on a classical ideal, but then following the end of the Bebe era, we come into the German character dolls who are based on real children and reflect the modernist movement. These dolls we're going to end our tour with are extremely rare dolls. And I'm not even sure if there are any other examples in existence. There is not too much known about them other than the fact that their creator, Louis Lejeune, took out a patent for a trademark in 1915, which shows a winged A, winged letter A on the patent. But they have very sweet faces and they are definitely in the Bebe tradition rather than in the French character tradition. As I promised, we're going to end this tour of Julie's collection with this very unusual doll who has no ears. This concludes my portion of the tour of the Bluest collection. Again, I would like to thank Julie for her extreme generosity in sharing her collection with all of us today, and also to Ruby Lane for making sure that you have the ability to see part of her exceptional collection. Thank you very much.